Okay, so we are going to be looking at an example. The example is asking us the following. Are the statements if oh, sorry, are the statements if P or Q then R and if P then R or if Q then R are those two statements logically equivalent. Now I caution against us trying to use any of our logically equivalent statements here because we're going to run up against a problem and we won't know how to fix it clearly because we do not have the tools to do that. So he suggests that we run with truth tables. So let's set up our truth table. PQR, there's three different statements here. We start by four truths recorded underneath each other, then four falses. Now remember, this is just setting up the problem, so we're not doing anything. We're just making sure that by doing this, we set up all the possibilities that we can come across in terms of truth values for the three statements and for the three combined. So there's a true, a false, a true, and a false. So the first thing we're going to apply our mind to is P or Q. Now remember, P or Q is true when P or Q or both are true. P is true there, P is true here, P is true here, and true there. The rest of it is false. We look at Q, it's true there, it's true there, two falses, another truth, another truth, a false here, and then also a false there. Now we're going to look at the statement as it stands over there. We have a conditional P or Q, so if P or Q, then R is what we're looking at. Now remember, for us to, for, to, to um, write our truth values down here in the column, we have to remember that this is true when the first is false or the second is true or both are true. So we go to where the first is false and we record truths there. Okay. Then we go to the second and the second has to be true. So R has to be true which is over there and over here. Here it's false and there it's false. So this concludes the first part of what we're looking at. Okay, let us go to the second part. The conditional statement if P then R. Now we've just done one of those and then we're going to also do Q then R and then we're going to do the combination. Um, the first or the second, the A or the B. Okay, so I'm going to call this A for now, that B for now, so we have A or B. We don't have to write the whole thing out. So when is this true? It's true when P is false. So P is false in the last four. So there we go. R is true in the first, then in the second it's false, it's true in the third, so we have two falses over there. Now so far you can see it looks exactly like the one next to it. It's going to be the same over here. Q and R. Where Q is false, we're going to record a truth. So there's a truth in row 3 and row 4, and in the last second, uh, the two last rows, there's a false for the condition Q. Then we look at R and we search for a truth at R. So there's a truth there. There will be a false. The third one is already accounted for. The fourth one, there's a truth with the R. Okay. And in the third last, there's a false. Okay. So we've got true, false, true, 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 false, true, 
and we have a truth over here. Let's just remind ourselves again. Q then R means Q must be false. So there's the Qs that were false. And then we go to the R column and we look where there are truths recorded there and we duplicate them where their spaces are still open. So now we go to the last part. We go to the A or B. Now remember A or B is true when the first or the second or both are true. Okay, so the first and the second are both true there. They false over here. There's another truth recorded. They say again the first or the second or both are true. So there's a truth there. There's a truth here. There's a truth there. There's a truth there. And there's a truth over there. So there's one false. And the false happens in row number two. Okay, so look at the fourth and the sixth row. So we're zooming in on number four, five, and six. In this case, our statement A or B is true. But if we look at the statement over here, so this is the outcome of statement two over there. True, true, false, false, true, true. There's a disjunction there. There's, oh, sorry, I'm using the wrong language. But there's a false and a true recorded over here. So there's a problem with the equivalence of these two statements. True, 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 and true, true. Now, in this case over here in number six, let's just have a look. If the first, then the second means where the first, let's just see that everything that we've done here is 100% correct for row number six. Um, if P or Q, now P or Q was recorded again, let's just go over that. P or Q, when P or Q or both are true. Okay, so it's true there, P, true there, true there, true there. Then the rest was false. We go to Q. True there, true there. There was a false over here, but that was already true for the first one. Okay, that's the same. Then we recorded a truth there, because for Q it's a truth. Then there's a true, and a false, and a false. Okay, so this column is correct. We go to if this, then that. Where this was false, we record truths. Okay, so it was false there, false here. We recorded two truths over there. Then we go to R and we recorded all the truths. So a truth there, a truth there, a truth here, oopsie, and as you can see there, we have a problem. This is indeed a false. Okay, it's a false because it's not a truth in that column. So there's two spaces where these two things are not the same. Let me just make this in thick black so we can see where the mistake was. Okay, so what does that tell us? The statements are therefore not logically equivalent. And that's what we can conclude about them. They are not logically equivalent because everywhere else they are, but in those two rows they contradict one another. Okay, let's continue. Earlier we claimed that the following was a valid argument. The vegetables. If Edith eats her vegetables, then she can have a cookie. Now remember, I'm drawing your attention to the fact that that is an if-then example. Okay, so it's if P then Q. It continues to say Edith ate her example of <laughs> vegetables. <laughs> Therefore, Edith gets a cookie. Now let's see. How do we know this is valid? Let's look at the form of the statements. Let P denote Edith eats her vegetables. 
and Q denote the fact that Edith can have a cookie. The logical form of the argument is then that if P then Q. P happened, therefore Q happened. Okay, so this is what we call a form of an argument. And important to realize is that this is always valid. It's a form and it's always valid. So you want to record this somewhere so that it is one of those referent things that you commit to memory. Okay, let's see. We call that a deduction rule. It's an example of a deduction rule. An argument form which is always valid. So please folks, take a highlighter now, highlight this in your notes and notice that this is always valid. So that's a first deduction rule that you are going to commit to memory. Okay? This one is a particularly famous one. It's called the modus proponens. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Okay? Are you convinced that it's a valid deduction rule? If not, consider the truth table. Now, there's your truth table which you've already committed to memory. Okay? It says, therefore, um, if P, then Q, and P is true if both of them are true. Okay, that's what we uh, recognize over there. Okay, so let's see. Coming down. Just as the truth table for P, if P then Q. But what matters here is that all the lines in the deduction rule have their own column in the truth table. Okay? Now remember, that is what that first form represented. Okay. Remember that an argument is valid provided the conclusion must be true given that the premises are true. So, if P then Q and P are both true, we see that Q must be true as well. So, if P then Q and P are both true. So, if P then Q and P of both of them are true, we must see that Q must be true as well. Okay. Okay, our first example. Show that. If P then Q, not P then Q, then Q is a valid deduction rule. We need to show this and we're going to show this by making up a truth table which contains all the lines of the argument form. Okay, so let's see. Our truth table deals with two statements. It has P and it has Q in it. Okay, so we go true, true, false, false. True, false, True, false, and again, we're just setting this up to cover everything that we need to. Then we're going to look at P, then Q. So we're going to have a column for each of the statements that are recorded in this deduction rule. Okay, so P, then Q is true if P is false. So it's true there, true there. Now remember, we're going to learn this and commit this to memory. So this conditional statement is always true, false, true, true, true. We do the negation of P, the not P column is the opposite of what's in the P column. So false, false, true, true. Then we go not P, then Q. So we're looking between those two columns, starting with this one and looking at that one after we've looked 
at the first one. Now remember, we cannot apply the same rule that we did here for the, these two because they're not in that form. Okay, so we're looking at the negation of P. If the negation of P, then Q. So we start with the negation being false and we record the truths there. Then we go to Q, and we look at where it's true. It's true in the third column, so here it will be false. It will have three truths and a false, which is what happened over there. Okay, so now we've had these two statements done separately. Let's just mark them. There's number one, there's number two. That's the outcome for one, this is the outcome for the second statement. Okay, so now we're looking at, therefore, Q, the final statement. So what do we have to do? We have to take P, then Q, and look at it and, uh, as a statement, an AND statement. So in other words, a conjunction, not P, then Q. Q. Now remember the conjunctions are true when both of them are true. So we look at the first, they they both true. Here the one is false, the other one true. There they both true. Here the one is false and the other one is true. Okay, so we're recording a false over there. So what does this tell us? Look at the rows, P then Q, and the negation of P then Q. Look at all the rows for which those two things are indeed true. There they true, false, true, false. This only happens therefore in row 1 and row 3. In row 1 it's true, and in row 3 it's true. Okay? In those rows, Q is true as well. So the argument form is therefore valid. It is therefore a valid deduction rule. Okay? Let's look again. We can conclude the column not P, just as a step here that we did in helping us to get this rule. So we included that rule. We looked at that statement. It had, had truth value in row 1, row 3 and row 4. The statement, the negation of P then Q had truth value in the first three rows and was false in the fourth. Then we did the conjunction of the two, okay? If this, this, then, oh, this and that. So one and two. We looked at their truth values, the ands are true, the conjunctions are true where both are true. So they were true there, not both true here. True there, not both true here. So it only happened in row 1 and row 3, these two things were indeed true. Okay, so hey, in these rows, Q is true as well. Okay, Q is true as well in those two rows. Okay, so the argument is therefore a valid argument. If this is true, and that is true, Q was indeed true. So it is a valid deduction rule. Our second example asks us to deduce whether these three statements has as a result this. So if these are true, is that true? Is this a valid deduction rule? In other words, now please note we have three statements. So we have P, Q, and R. 
we go to our truth tables and we start setting up a column for each one of those statements. We start with four truths, four falses for P. Then true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. And here true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. Okay, we're going to look at the conditional statement if P then R, looking at that truth value. We look at the truth value of Q then R. So let's start with those two first. Well, this condition is true where P is false. So we have true, 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 true. We go to R, where R is true, we record more truths. So there's two falses in that first column. It's in row 2 and in row 4. We then go for if Q then R. So we look at Q where it's false. We record truths. So there's four truths recorded at Q. Where R is true, we transfer truths to the column. So there's a false and there's a false. Then we have to look at the statement um, P or Q. Okay, we're going to look at the statement now for P or Q. Okay, so that is our final statement here. This we don't have to look at. We've recorded it already. There's truths there. True, 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 true. So there's statement three. Let's label this. There's statement three. Here is statement one. There's statement two. And we're now going to look at the concluding statement, which will be recorded in that column. Now, P or Q. P or Q, we look at P or Q is true when P or Q or both are true. P or Q, true, 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 Q is true over here, Q is true over there, they both false there, they both false over here. Okay, so let us now compare 1, 2, and 3. Okay, there 1, 2, and 3 all have truths. 1, 2, and 3. There's a truth there, a truth for this, and a truth for that. There's three falses that we recorded over here. Two falses, rather, over there, and there's a false under the R. Okay, so we're looking for another where all three are true. So true, true, true. True, true, true. And that's all. So what we need to look at here is what happens over there. What happens above that line? And what happens here? Do they record truths in the last column? Now let's have a look. We have a true over there, which indeed makes it true. We've got a true over there. We've got a true over here. In the second last column, we have another three truths. There's a true, there's a true, and there is a true. We missed that one. But there's a false in the fourth column, the fourth important column. So what does this tell us? It tells us that this is not a valid deduction rule because it was true, 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 but in one instance it recorded a false. So it is definitely not a true um, deduction rule. Okay, let us recap again. What did we just see? We saw in row 1, row 3, and row 5 that there were truths recorded all over. But 
in row number 7 there was an untruth. So it did not make this deduction rule true. But what we have done here is we've discovered the following rule. Deduction rule. We've discovered if P then R is true, and if Q then R is true, and if P or Q is true, then R will definitely be true. So let's see. If P then R is true, Q then R is true, and P then P or Q is true, then R is true. See? Therefore, R. The same here. Those three are true, hence that is true. If these three are true, then that one is true. If these three were true, then that would have been true. So this here is a true deduction rule. Now you can get quite a few of them in your work if you look at and analyze your truth table properly. Okay, our next focus is going to go beyond propositions and we will look at some very complicated examples. So, yeah, let's see what it means. Okay, we're moving in, <coughs> excuse me, beyond propositions. Now in your book it says in the beginning, we saw that not every statement can be analyzed using logic connectors only. For example, if we want to work with a statement, this is our statement, all primes greater than two are odd. Now let's just analyze that statement for a second. All primes. This is universal. It covers all the primes. Then it has greater than two, which is a condition set on all those primes. And then it comes to a conclusion, or odd. So if we want to change this into a statement, we need quantifiers. Now remember, we learned about existential quantifiers, meaning there exists a da 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 and universal meaning for all. Okay, <clears throat> so this is for all values of is universal. This covers all and this there exists a. That's what these two symbols represent. So to the right this um, sentence um, symbolically we need those quantifiers. All primes. Okay, how do we write that? Well, for all x's, the existential statement, p of x is prime and x is bigger than 2. Then, ox, x is odd. So for all x's, such that, not such that, but for all x's, p of x is prime, and x is bigger than 2, implies that x is odd. Okay, if we represent all primes with p, and all odds with o, then we've changed this sentence into a sentence that uses symbols and quantifiers to communicate the same message. <clears throat> okay, so in this case, again, we've used P of X to denote X is prime, and O of X to denote X is odd. These are not propositions since their truth value depends on the input value of x. Okay, so they're not propositions at all. Better to think of p and o as denoting properties of their input. Very important. So highlight that for yourself. That p and o is denoting properties of their input value x.
The technical term for these are called predicates. A sentence that contains variables is a predicate. Okay, we call them predicates in logic. We need to use predicate logic. So we need to use variable logic. It is important to stress that predicate logic extends propositional logic. Now we've worked with propositional logic up in this whole chapter so far. Okay? Much in the way quantum mechanics extends classical mechanics. So for those of you that are interested in that statement, that's why I <laughs> highlighted it for you. Okay, so you will notice that our statement above still used the propositional logical connectives. Everything that we learned about logical equivalence and deductions still applies. However, predical, predicate logic allows us to analyze statements at a higher resolution, digging down into the individual propositions P and Q, etc. Okay, so let's look at an example at this point. Okay, here's our example. Suppose we claim that there is no smallest number. Okay, now let's take this and let's turn it into a statement that contains symbols. Okay, so we can say there exists an x such that for all y values not such that. There exists an x for all y values where x is less than equal to y. Now this will say that there is a smaller number. You can always find an x that is small or equal to y. So we have to negate this statement. There does not exist an x, so for all y's x is smaller and equal to y. Okay, that's our statement that we are making. Okay, so literally this is not true. That there is a number x such that for all x, y, x is less than or equal to y. However, we know how negation interacts with quantifiers. Okay, so if we take this we can pass a negation over a quantifier by switching the quantifier type. We've learned that before. Between universal to existential. Okay? So the statement, this statement is logically equivalent to the following. This is logically equivalent to. For all x, there exists a y. So the negation just changes the quantifiers, okay, such that y is always less than x. These two here are logically equivalent statements. So th for all x's there is a y, so that y is smaller than x, is the negation of that statement at the top. Not there exists an x, so for all y's x is small or equal to y. Okay? Notice here that y smaller than x is a negation of x smaller and equal to y. This literally is saying that for every number x, for all x's, there exists a number y such that y is smaller than x. We see that this is another way to make our original claim. So those two things are in a way saying exactly the same thing. Now the question arises, can you switch the order of quantifiers? In other words, 
quantifies, remember, these two things, universal, existential. So can we swap them around? Are these two, therefore, logically equivalent? So for all x's, there exists a y, such that p x y. For all y's, uh, there exists a y, such that for all x's, p x y. Okay, the question is now, are those logically equivalent? Okay, so let's see. If we look at those two statements, folks, they are not logically equivalent. To see this, we should provide an interpretation of the predicate PXY, which makes one of the statements true and the other one false. So we're going to let PXY represent the predicate X is smaller than Y. It is true in the natural numbers that for all x, for all x's, there does exist a y such that y is greater than x. Okay, so there's, there's infinitely many numbers for which that is true. However, there's not a natural number y there. There doesn't exist a natural number y which is greater than every single number x. Okay, there's no natural number y, which is always greater than any number, um, any uh, yeah, <coughs> natural or even number, whatever you want to call it, x. Thus, it is possible for this to be true while this is false under this predicate. Okay, so we cannot reverse. We cannot do the reverse of this though. So we can't go from that being true and then this. There's, if there is some y for which x satisfies the predicate, then certainly for every x there's some y that also satisfies the predicate. In other words, while we don't have logical equivalence between our two statements, we do not have a valid deduction rule. So there exists a y such that for all x's p x y. Then for all x's there exists a y such that p x y. Put yet another way, this says that the single statement, this statement here, for there exists a y for all x, so that for all x p x y implies that statement. It doesn't. That is always true, but it doesn't work the other way around. So what's written over here now? is exactly what is represented by this deduction rule. Okay, so you can read all about this in your book on page 280. It makes a quite a long argument that tries to make sense of what is happening over here in this example. Okay, now folks, please remember there are exercises at the end of your chapter that you can now start doing. There's 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 of them that you can work through. Start with those that you have the answers for at the back of the book so that you can make sure that you are learning something that is correct when you practice your homework. Our next focus will be our third video and that will focus on proofs and methods of proof that we're going to use in discrete mathematics.